Welcome to Walking Away from Arcadia. We're doing a little bit of a special episode today. We're not going to be going into a particular topic, but instead we're going to be talking about the preview PDF of Changeling to Dreaming 20th Anniversary Edition. It dropped a couple weeks ago. Simon and I have had the time to look over it mostly uh, enough to sort of talk about what we like, what we wish was a little bit different. And so we wanted to get in and hammer this one out. It'll be a little less um, polished around the edges. It's going to be a little more of a simple conversation, but we thought it was important to get something out. So Changeling the Dreaming 20th anniversary came out. I've mentioned it in a couple episodes and we have a couple episodes that were recorded before it dropped that we're still going to air, even though a couple things will be a little out of place. It's, it's interesting. It's <laughs> really, I, you know, people talk about having mixed feelings about things. And normally that means the, I'm trying to cushion that I don't like it. I have legitimately bipolar mixed feelings about this text. Yeah. <laughs> there are swaths of it. I am desperately in love with. There are areas that I'm like concerned about, but they might just be editorial problems. And then there are a couple things where I'm just like, what? <laughs> I. So. So it's yeah, very Simon, in keeping with Changeling. It, it is. <laughs> um, what What are your sort of first broad impressions? Um. So I'm the kind of person who tends to read, even boring technical manuals and role-playing game books cover to cover rather than skipping around and even if I wanted to skip around I'm reading it on a really old tablet which doesn't yeah. deal with that particularly well so I'm reading this cover to cover I'm about 200 pages in at this point and I've finally emerged from the all of the setting information basically into the descriptions of the kits and the arts and realms. My initial take on what I was reading was that I liked some of the changes and some of the other changes were inexplicable, confusing, and maddening. Like... <laughs> The only autumn she, during the interregnum, being House Liam and House Gathic, which is contradicted later in the book and honestly is probably just an editing error. It's so I actually saw an exchange with one of the Changeling writers, uh, not the lead dev, but one of the writers uh, on the Changeling Facebook group, and she clarified that all she that stayed behind and they could be from any house, they are Autumn She. This is a weird topic for me. Thus far, it is actually the, the thing in the book that frustrates me the most, which surprised me because I've always wanted Autumn She in other houses. I just wanted Autumn She in other houses in a way that made sense. So, and for background, for anyone who might not know about Autumn She, in the original edition, House Skathak stayed behind. And Skathak had a relationship with humans. The founder of the house had kind of been a changeling as opposed to a true fae. Certainly by the Dark Ages fae description, she would qualify as a changeling. Not the modern example given in, in Changeling the Dreaming. And so they stayed behind and remained commoners, and they could reincarnate, and it was a story that was unique to them. But all kinds of other she stayed behind as well, just not in numbers. And whenever they get brought up in original source material, they die out, the way modern Arcadian she do, the ones that came back during the resurgence. And I always went, oh, that limits story potential. I actually, I never liked that. I, I love the inclusion of the autumn she in this book. What's frustrating for me is the confusion. <laughs> At the beginning, it's Liam and Skathak. At the beginning of the house section, it says, here are the returning houses that came back during the resurgence and joined Skathak. And Liam is in the returning houses, and it's confusing. And then you get down to uh, the first house that jumped out at me was 
Fiona, and in their exile, it mentions Fiona, she that stayed behind, and how the Arcadian she are trying to rejoin their lost relatives. And it's that lost relatives part that made me, you know, very clear, oh, they're meant to be Autumn She, but like, which is it? And as I was reading this, I went, okay, I'm just going to jump ahead to the Autumn She splat, like the two, the two page. Surely there will be a couple sentences here that will be like, you know, it's mostly Liam and Skathak, a handful of other houses, you know, were there any Arcadian She before at all? And, and there's no clarification on that. Like, there's nowhere in the book where it just says this is what's going on. And it's not an intentional, like, unreliable narrator thing. It's just nowhere in the book this thing that they invoke as a concrete construct is just laid out. And it's it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I... Honestly, I think some of my upset over that point was misplaced because it's clearly just a weird quirk of it being a product of many, many writers and maybe not enough editing so far, which is fine. It's a preview. Yeah, and I definitely think that is the case. I followed some of the other work of the lead dev and he is, you know, and I've even seen him talk about his dev approach and he does, he pulls in a lot of writers. You know, it's not like for anyone who sort of followed how the lead dev on mage 20th develops he writes like 90 percent of it himself because he doesn't like to clean this stuff up and you know so it's it's a different product in that respect and it it's just weird when you're first reading it i wouldn't want to give the book to someone and expect them to learn the setting from scratch from this book even though this concept yeah. is only presented in this book um, yeah the other the other part of it that frustrates me and again, this is an idea I've wanted in the game for years, so it's weird to be for me to be frustrated by it, is they make a big deal out of how the returning Arcadian she refused to sully their souls by binding them to humans in the changeling way. And so they stayed Arcadian she, and now no one knows what happens when they die because they didn't do the changeling way ritual. It's a little different from what came before, where... Nope, they don't reincarnate. And everybody has a theory about what really happens to them, but they don't come back full stop or finished. And I get the wanting to add the mystery. When you first look at the mystery, it I get that. It's it's a nice aesthetic for Changeling. But what's weird about it is it's a choice. And that's, that's a big character thing. Like, that's a big crux. It's a choice, and it's something they chose not to do. And the story for the Autumn She is that there was like one final portal on Earth as the shattering was happening and all the She were trying to fight their way through it. And they have a little war in the backstory about this portal because, you know, all the She wanted to be the ones who got through it before it collapsed. So Skathak and Liam stayed behind willingly, maybe a handful of Fiona and other houses that had strong ties to humans. But a lot of the She that stayed behind just didn't get through the portal before it collapsed. At least that's the impression I got. Again, it's not stated that clearly, but that's the story they seem to be telling. And so if we say everyone that didn't make it through that portal became a normal changeling, that's not choice. Like, there's no choice there. That's some sort of cosmological constant. Because if you've ever seen a group of people with a choice in front of them, even if only one person doesn't make the normal choice, somebody is not going to make the standard choice. And so having it be that absolute, everyone who stayed behind reincarnates and their autumn she and everyone who came in the resurgence refuses to sully themselves doesn't make any sense to me. There's no, like, there is no implication of choice there. And it wipes out all the stories of the she dying and it being tragic from the previous canon. Yeah, and that was one of the things I really liked in the old canon was even the she who were left behind, stayed behind, regretted their choice kind of a thing, they buried themselves in little pockets of the dreaming and slowly went mad the same way, you know, other commoners did in a weird mm -hmm. attempt to preserve their immortality, even if they did undergo the changeling ritual. And... I kind of really liked that. 
I really liked that too. I also really liked the tragedy of a couple of the houses that were close to humans. You know, having some she stay behind and you know, you can ha you can keep the choice dynamic. You can keep all the things that they introduced in C20 if you just don't make it as absolute and the old stories still work, they just change a little. You know, before they stay behind and it's a tragedy that they died because they weren't able to go through the changeling way, I guess. Maybe they chose not to. And you get, you know, Fiona, and that's tragic, especially the love stories and, you know, reincarnation of human souls and re-meeting with their fey lover. I mean, there's all kinds of juicy potential there. And then the immortal fey dies. Like, I wouldn't want to give that up. You have House Dougal, where there's this whole thing about a handful of she that stay behind and they ran the house after the shattering. They slowly died out. The commoner changelings that were loyal to them took over and started running the house. And it was an active she house run by non-she for most of the interregnum boom, the resurgence, the Arcadian she come back and they're like, oh, we have the she back. We missed you. There was this tragedy, but oh, we have to give up everything we have. And there's just so much complicated story there. And mm -hmm. none of it fits their new model. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I'm, I'm not one that's like, change is bad. I don't like change. But this book has like a paragraph and a half, maybe, okay. I'm exaggerating. Maybe three paragraphs, perhaps. Because that's all they had space for. And I get that. But if you're going to retcon a whole house in a text like that, that's kind of a problem. Yeah, and... Like... <laughs> honestly, I don't understand why they didn't do... Why they didn't borrow a page from the Mage book and just do, you know, a changeling version of the possible future sidebars where... The future fades? Yeah, the future yeah. fates, where they just acknowledge that we have a canon split. Well, and it's this also gets back to a much broader thing. I actually think game books are a terrible format for telling fixed stories. Like, don't don't tell a fixed story in a game book because people want to run their games, and the canon should get out of the way. There should be enough of it to provide hooks, but it should fundamentally get out of the way. You know, do a right. comic do a comic series in your world, do whatever to tell your story, but don't do it in the game books. So one of the places I feel like they actually did a pretty good job of telling, making space for story rather than shoehorning the canon in is by splitting the Autumn She and the Arcadian She into two different splats. In this case, the Arcadian She reflect the otherworldliness of the she they are inhumanly beautiful they have a mastery over time while the autumn she are earthly beautiful rather than inhumanly beautiful and they have a mastery over the physical world and that was something i always thought was kind of lacking from the she given that they are local deities more or less and in older versions of Changeling, they had absolutely no connection to the locality they were in or from. Yeah, I I also liked that change because something that I never liked about the She before, and the, this goes back to just first edition design techniques and approaches that, you know, then they were sort of saddled with, is the She were these unearthly beauties. Well, you know, not everybody likes the lithe elf look as it turns out. Right now, actually, it seems like especially, you know, among men, it's all about beards and being burly. And, you know, that wasn't true even when I was in college. And then you go back to the 80s and it's a totally different thing. You know, attractiveness is part of social standards. And there are wide arrays of what is stunningly beautiful. And... You know, I thought about the number of times my head has been turned by just, like, a really, really burly guy. And I'm like, yeah, you know, this, their birthright and the way they're described, it, it it's so limiting. And I love the change that they put in place now because now the she can embody all of that. And I really appreciate that. I mean, beyond the Arcadian Autumn she... I do have to say there were a lot of other things in the flavor section I actually really appreciated. 
there's a brief section where they talk about Christianity's role in transforming the stories of the Fae. And the Fae from the Isles, the British Isles, have an interesting relationship with Christianity because, you know, Christianity would come in and try to demonize whatever the local religion was. There's, you know, lots of stories about Lucifer and Pan and satyrs and other horned gods and how it was, it was a propaganda campaign and an attempt to manipulate people's beliefs. They tried to do that with the fair folk, except they only kind of half succeeded uh, in the real world. And that event, that relationship has never really been acknowledged. And I really appreciated that it was included. I also really appreciated that they brought the Fomorians and the Tuatha into a cycle of having opposed each other as opposed to being these forever things. It reflects the Irish cycle of invasions. There were a lot of other nice touches in the flavor. Some of the confusing stuff we mentioned, there are other examples of as well, although smaller. But I did like a lot of that stuff that they added. One of the things that I always find very frustrating that role-playing books love to do is, and C20 did this too, providing a lot of setting information, like specific setting location, like cities. And I, it's, it's a really weird experience for me because I'm ambivalently annoyed about this. Because on the one hand, they did this thing that I find kind of eh. Like... I can come up with my own settings, thanks. And on the other hand, they skipped creating setting for the vast majority of Concordia, and I think the main reason I noticed this was because they skipped the state I live in, which is a tiny, tiny thing, but at the same time I looked at the the list of regions that are supposed to be in that kingdom, and they included Illinois and Missouri, I think, out of the 12, I think, states in that kingdom, which is really weird. It's a strange design choice to me. Yeah, that is a strange design choice. I yeah, I have to be honest, I haven't read any of those little localized setting areas. I skipped them for the general Concordian stuff. I skipped them for the Nunahi. Um, you know, I went through and I looked through the Nunahi because the way they have been presented in the game is something that I was hoping might get a little bit of cleanup and, you know, I really like the Nunahi and I would like them to be more integrated into the story. So I wanted to see what Onyx Path had done with that. But all that stuff on the various regions of the U.S. and the general history about Native Americans in those regions, I'm like, no, I'm not going to read this. I'm I understand why that stuff is there. There may be like five paragraphs per region and it's important. I'm glad it's there. It avoids the kind of orientalist sins that were maybe committed a bit with Kindred of the East. But as much as I think it's important to acknowledge that different regions have different cultures, if I ever use the Nunahi, I will be doing direct research. I'm, you know, a handful of paragraphs aren't going to be useful. <laughs> I, I don't want to inspect that on that particular level. And I felt the same way about the regions in Concordia. I went, I'm, I'm not going to, if, if I actually end up using these handful of paragraphs, it's because I'm doing a one shot and I don't care. <laughs> I mean. The last piece of setting and flavor stuff that we want to touch on is uh, it was one of the stretch goals for the Kickstarter. Changeling 20th has the Create a Kith section, where it describes the, the rules for designing your own kith, making your own birthrights, making your own frailties, that sort of a thing. And I feel like it does what it's set out to do, honestly. There isn't a whole lot to say about it. I feel like it's a little minimalist, in that most of what what is explicitly said in it about the you know, design goals for a birthright or the design goals for a frailty or the design goals for a kith are things that at least I managed to tease out from reading, but I'm also a very analytical reader, so I may not be the best judge of that. <laughs> what did you think about it, Victor? 
Um, I looked through it and I like it. That said, I don't know that I would use it, but I don't think, I think I would not use it for similar reasons to why I think you wouldn't use it. I mean, I've seen your uh, homebrew write-ups. I've seen the detail that you put into them. For me, the power of the creative kit section was never that there would be a system so comprehensive and so illuminating and so expansive that it would be useful to a person who would write a 50 page module before doing a long form chronicle because if it was useful to that sort of person which let's be honest you are that person i'm kind of that person although i improv a little bit more then it wouldn't be useful to most of the people that it would actually help so i read it and to me i thought back on you know when i first started role playing and i did some ridiculous module stuff in high school even and the friends that I had, and it it sparks the right ideas for the sort of player that needs to be given permission to do a thing in the book. And in that respect, I think it's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it does everything that it was intended to do. I just, maybe unfairly, I compare it to the Dark Ages Fae character creation, process which is in most ways a lot more open and accessible it suffers a little bit from not explicitly saying like this is the difference between a minor feature and a major feature but it's stuff you can puzzle out without too much effort and eh, I mean the kits are just a core part of changeling at this point and while I might philosophically disagree that they need to be, eh, that's it. Like, it, it just comes down to a matter of taste for me. Yeah, I mean, if you go and look at what Matt did with Beast in terms of creating, uh, honestly, what is a very changeling-like creature in Chronicles of Darkness, uh, much more horror-focused and less wonder and fairy tale, but similar cosmological creature it has that sort of generic flexibility when you look at what happened in changeling the lost and dark ages fey and graceful wicked masks it's clear that after changeling the dreaming they realized oh this splat format that we've been using for the last four games and we feel like we have to use is limiting but now it's the game <laughs> i think that's just the downside of it being a 20th anniversary edition and not a scrap and rewrite and they, they were able to scrap and rewrite a lot more than I thought they'd be able to. But, you know, that's just, that's first edition design mentality. And all of the five core games are saddled with it a little bit. On the topic of scrap and rewrites, there are the arts and the realms, which, which I, are... I have to admit, I'm only partway through that section. So I'm going to let Victor do most of the talking here. <laughs> So the arts and the realms are actually kind of my favorite part of the book. I have other areas that I love that I hope we have time to get to, but the arts and the realms for me are the biggest improvement overall. The old art realm, I don't want to say system because they really didn't change the system, but I'll say the old art and realm descriptions were not illuminating. A lot of the arts, you read them, and by second edition, they did a pretty good job of calling out the realm relationships. The whole realm cantrip thing in first edition was a little weird. I did go back and look at that recently, and they they describe what different realms do for some powers and not others. And it was just confusing. You know, something like hopscotch was relatively easy to figure out. Something like I'm summoning fire with primal well what do the realms really do with that and in c20 they did a much better job when you go through the powers of explaining on most of the powers exactly what the realm decides and sometimes they get a little creative it's not always the obvious thing and there are a handful of powers where not every realm impacts them although they didn't reprint the arts that were really bad about that in the previous edition 
the Shadow Court arts are gone. I do not miss them. Oh and... no, no more anti-sovereign. No, anti-sovereign is gone. Whatever will I do? I have no idea. And infusion, the weird knocker art that only worked with Faye because it only affected Kimura. I guess you could use scene to do an area of effect on Chimera. And it, I, uh... yeah, I don't miss those arts and I'm not upset that they weren't included. Uh, they also rebalanced things. Primal is no longer purchased to win. I am okay with that. It makes sense thematically. Thank God. I am also okay with that. Oh my god. Just from a game design perspective, Primal was the most efficient XP expenditure you could undertake. And yes, that always was. bothered me. Yeah, I mean, every game has that power set that's a little cooler, but like the the difference in scope of usefulness with Primal was really broken before. And they split up the healing and strike uh, power that used to be one power, Heather Balm and Holly Strike. You got them at fourth level, Primal, all together. And even though it didn't say it in the power, later in Changeling Second, it acknowledged that Holly Strike did aggravated damage. And you were like, oh, wow, really? So I get like the equivalent of two fourth level powers all at once, and I get to mix them with the realms, and I can make it AoE? Yippee! No, no more of that. <laughs> Holly Strike was put in Dragon's Ire, which is the combat art, and Heather Balm doesn't exist the way it worked before, but there is basically a corollary healing cantrip, and it is in the spring art. They introduced seasonal arts, which I also really like. It added some much needed flavor and tied into animist roots. Uh, we've talked about that in other shows, some of which have aired, some haven't, about how the European Fae don't really feel all that animist, and they should. That was one of the biggest things I liked. Speaking back to that Christianity changing Fae stories tie-in, they acknowledged that and they brought back some of that animism. I really like the new arts a lot. They aren't perfect. The Fae don't get to do much of any aggravated damage. Uh, I saw some exchange about, like, 5th level, the 5th level weather art. I forget the name of it now. as a lightning strike art. But it just does lethal if it's a weird effect. And I read that and I went, it's the 5th level art. And it's lightning. If you're spending the glamour or calling on the weird or exposing yourself that way, I would let that be aggravated. Yeah, I haven't gotten all the way through the arts yet, but I was a little surprised that Dragon's Ire doesn't do ag. Yeah, I, I I don't know if part of that balancing was the realization that, wow, you know, with the scene realm, doing ag with arts is really, really powerful. Like, arguably more powerful than the mage ag damage systems. Yeah. And it is. Yeah, but, but even even though I really do like the the way they split off Primal into being better in basically every way, they also nerfed Dragon's Ire. It's just interesting to me that by making this Dragon's Ire art, they've replaced the old game's Dragon's Ire, which honestly was an underutilized and kind of overpowered martial arts system where you were generating glamour by by the process of the terrible beauty of battle more than anything else and the only thing that really saved it from actually being overpowered was it was a couple of paragraphs buried in the systems chapter so nobody ever used it except me really and <laughs> But at the same time, in the middle of a fight, you are refilling the glamour of basically everybody around you. Whenever you do more than five successes on a combat maneuver or something like that, which is pretty easy if you're built the right way. Yeah, what I would love to see, actually, because I do really like those rules. I've never gotten to use them. 
is I'd love to see them get around to doing a book of houses, which for some of the reasons I talked about earlier, I think is pretty needed at this point. And doing this Kathak martial art and folding in some of the Dragon's Ire stuff. Because in addition to Dragon's Ire being kind of weird and kind of unbalanced and buried in the rules section, there's also this Kathak martial art and it felt a little duplicative. So I'd really love to see all of those dynamics folded together into that martial art and have it be rare and have it be a story point. I think that would actually improve the makeup of the game overall. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad solution, I think. Other than the arts, there are also the slivers, which are the inanime versions of the arts. How did those fare? Uh, the slivers are the only thing in the game, in terms of rules, that I just actively dislike. There are things like the certain high-level arts that don't do ag that I think is a little weird, and I might golden rule. Like, there are little things in every White Wolf game. The slivers felt to me like an incomplete thought. Um, what they did with the slivers is they got rid of cantrips for the inanime altogether. And I kind of understand why they did this, because I've read people who complained about the old slivers. They had a lot of duplicative power with the arts, and they felt vestigial, which is not inaccurate. So what they did in C20 is you can only unleash slivers. And unleashing is a concept that was introduced in Dark Ages Fey, and they put it in C20, where instead of crafting this very careful cantrip, you just call on the deepest powers of the dreaming and you let it flow through you and you maybe try to guide it a little and like lens it through an art or whatever. But really you don't have a lot of control over what happens. You ask the dreaming very nicely for something, simple one declarative statement, and you hope that you don't lose total and complete control. And there are dice systems around. If you roll too many successes, you lose total and complete control. One or two successes is actually ideal on an unleashing. And the slivers can only be unleashed. And they describe it as the inanime are older and more primal and they're not good at giving things shape. And so they can't do the more detailed cantrip magic. And I, I get the tropes and themes they were trying to invoke. That part, I don't love that part, but it isn't actually the part I dislike. What I dislike is unleashing creates nightmare. And nightmare causes bedlam. Nightmare is the primary bedlam mechanic now. And bedlam thematically is about the toxicity that glamour has on your human soul and the insanity you get if you gain too much exposure to glamour, which makes sense for Nightmare. I'm a changeling, I'm a human, I'm letting all this dreaming flow through me. Some of it's gonna roll over and sort of corrupt my sanity and my human soul, and the inanime don't have human souls. Right. <laughs> which makes it a really weird choice. Yeah, there's... Not I'm to mention little... that the whole... The inanime are naturalistic and they they don't weave well thing contradicts some of the material in Dark Ages Fae, where sometimes they blame human beings learning how to weave on the inanime. Which, by the way, I love that story because of how it feeds into Mage. I love the idea that we taught humans how to weave. Now they're better at it than we are because Mages. And not that I think that's an absolute truth, but I think it's a really fun truth to use in Changeling. Yeah, I like... It does kind of get rid of it. Yeah, I, I really liked the potential of the whole, well, why did we teach them to do that since they're so good at it thing? Because it it invokes a, an interesting... I think it's hubris. It, it invokes an interesting hubris um, dynamic and it, it gives it a place in Changeling, which, honestly, Changeling and Mage are probably my two favorite World of Darkness games, and I'm in favor of tying them together in any way that happens most of the time. Yeah. So there's one other problem with the sliver dynamic and the always unleashing, and this is actually an editorial mistake, so it might get corrected. Keep this criticism 
like take it with a huge grain of salt. It has been reported in the errata thread. It might get fixed. Is there some text that specifically says sliver unleashings are always chimerical unless the weird has been called on? When you unleash, you automatically call in the weird. And so the rules just directly butt heads. And the inanime have always been portrayed as kind of these hidden, you know, folded away in the deep parts of the dreaming or in their anchors. They're not big, obvious things, except for occasionally salamanders. And even the salamanders, only when the fire, you know, bursts forth, it isn't a constant thing. So it doesn't work so well having it, them always calling on the weird. And it's obvious the developers knew that. And whoever wrote that rule set didn't think about the fact that unleashing always calls on the weird. So I thought about this a little bit and thematic issues with not letting an anime weave at all. Like if you're okay with the unleashing dynamic, if you change it so coaxed unleashings do not call on the weird automatically when done with a sliver and do not induce a nightmare because the inanime and the slivers have a more productive relationship with the dreaming, it does a couple things. It gives them a way to work magic that doesn't turn them into bedlam sinks. It reintroduces the decision about, do I want to take the dangerous action and just command the dreaming and not try to coax it? Because that introduces nightmare, that automatically calls on the weird, but coaxing is their safe conservative approach, but you still get that primal elemental, I'm not good at structured magic thing, if you like that theme. You know, thematic issues, you know, that kind of comes down to a point of preference, but I personally think that tweak at least fixes the structural problem with the system, and it's pretty easy to apply. Another really good, it's not so much a change as it is an iteration on the old idea, is they went to length to expand on what banality is, what glamour is, how these two things interact, and don't interact well, and how you get them. And they added a, a trait, a personality trait, to each kith where they have suggested banality triggers, and the seemings also have suggested banality tr I think they actually have mandatory banality triggers, which is a different thing, but still a good idea at the core. And the idea is rather than banality is a uniform force that affects everybody equally, which is kind of the impression you get from the old Changeling stuff. It's contradicted all over the place, but it's kind of the general feel you get. Each individual chooses banality triggers for their characters, and those things are the things that set you off for taking disbelief or banality or just becoming smaller and I thought that was the whole framing and discussion around that while like anything not perfect was probably as close as they're gonna get to perfect on this messy idea and they also added the revelries which are kith specific manners of replenishing glamour. The satyrs get it from partying kind of a thing. But they just give you this little thing that you can do to get a point of banality back if you have a second or more. If you, they give you this little thing you can do to get a point of glamour back if you've got an hour or two of downtime. Which is really merciful because even ravaging an NPC is a time investment. It's at least a couple of hours, because you gotta find somebody who has a connection to the dreaming, then you gotta figure out how to fuck with them, then you gotta do it. And the revelries, yeah. while I wish they had done a revelry for each the Seelie and the Unseelie version of the Kith, it's kind of a small criticism. So I'll say all of the criticisms I have about the banality triggers and the revelries, I almost don't even want to mention because I love the idea. I love the way it plays out. It reminds me of systems from much more narrative 
role-playing games that I've been looking into recently, a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse stuff, and I really, really like it. Most of my criticism, and picture that with big air quotes, more or less boils down to they were putting a lot of stuff in this book and they only had so much leeway to do new things. And while it is the shortest 20th anniversary book, at the same time, if they had fleshed out everything that I think needs to be fleshed out more, it would be longer than M20. It would, it would be a completely unmanageable text. And the triggers and revelries and one super special trigger for your character that who knows, maybe other people in your group might get glamour from, especially a knocker and i think that creates such amazing dynamics a couple things like the the seeming triggers there needs to be a list for each seeming because the triggers don't make sense for everyone and they right. especially don't make sense if you get into the galane and, yeah and especially since they decoupled the seemings from linear time and mortal age and linear progression it gets a little messy to say that a child who is not necessarily young but is a child in outlook is going to take a banality trigger relating to the inability to be disciplined it just doesn't make sense if you're 60 years old. If you're 60 years old and you have a child's wonder, you probably still have an adult's capacity to follow through on things. Yeah, and I love that they made that change to the seemings. It opens up like the old man character from Little Prince, which is really important. And so I think overall it's a good change, but again, it's a huge text. It was wrangling a lot of canon. It wasn't just wrangling rules, it was fixing rules left and right. So, yeah, things like, oh, we need a list of seeming options. Okay, I can write up a list of seeming options. Yeah, it's an incomplete thought, and I guess it's a criticism, but having the structure there to explain to players and have them read up on, and then hand them a list of extra trigger options I've written for the seemings and say, I'm going to give you some more options in the base book. I'm fine starting there. That is still such a massive improvement on previous editions. The new seeming rules are a huge improvement. Everything that I dislike about them is golden rollable, to be honest. Yeah, it, it really is. You know, one other crunch area I do want to talk about a little bit, because this was one of the things they just scrapped and started over, is Autumn People and the Dantain. And it's weird. I, this is like the exact opposite of the Autumn She, Arcadian She thing, where I thought I would love that and then it landed and I didn't even know I was getting it. And I went, oh, I don't love this so much. This is the exact opposite, where my favorite thing about the Dantain is gone now and I don't even care. <laughs> I want to replace it, but I don't even care that it's gone because what they put in place is so superior to what they had before. The thing I liked the most about the Dantain is something that was implicit to them, but wasn't really developed in the Autumn People book. And that is the idea of the self-loathing Fae. Anyone who is from certain, I'll say, sub-communities is familiar with this phenomenon. The super closeted politician trying desperately to, you know, pass every anti-LGBT law that he can, and then he gets caught having a very pretty boy lift his luggage you know that dynamic that i'm fey but i hate the fey is an important mechanism to sort of inspect things that happen in the real world the dante were always kind of that but the dooms weren't that the dooms were weird typhoid mary dark sorcerer i'm a business person they, they didn't they didn't tap the idea properly and this is a well-known thing so they redesigned the Dantain to be things that are corrupted. They're fey that have been branded and are wrong. And they do kind of invoke self-loathing. They're not like the Thalane. The Thalane are proud nightmares, and they are a fully functional manifestation of the darker parts of the dreaming, but they are they are what they're supposed to be. They are that part of the dreaming. The Dantain are wrong, and they view themselves through a lens of sin, and they reincarnate. They go through Chrysalis as Dante. You are marked. And they imp 
apply, there's maybe a way it could be fixed, but it's one of those, we're going to give you the super epic quest hook, but no, we're not going to tell you how it's done because it's basically impossible. But if your storyteller wants to make it possible, have fun, you know, and I'm, I'm fine with that. They're way more interesting. They don't have those weird agendas that cost the same thing as an art, but don't work with the realms anymore. They have an art of their own. It's a little, a couple levels of it are a little funky. And I think they needed the, here's how the realm applies, but they didn't get it. It's my only real critique about Ruin. What Ruin does is really cool. It's, it is the anti-fey art. It's terrifying and sickening. And so I really like what the Dante have become because they make sense. They make narrative sense. And I feel like they tap something, the corrupted wrongness of the dreaming that wasn't really there before. I mean, I think some people treated the Thelane that way, but it wasn't what the Thelane were. And so I like that it's there. And then the Autumn people, which are still just humans that have this really, really intimate relationship with banality, now have these things called stigmas that are really disgusting. I mean, they are, it's not, I'm going to make you count to 10, 500 times before you feel satisfied. It's these really deep, dark, shame-driven horrors that, you know, family and counselors do to us. We've all had that person in our life that has done those things. And they feel so much more vital than anything that was in the first edition Autumn Person book. You know, what I want to do to kind of fill that self-hating, addicted to glamour, can't stop themselves from coming back, but hates being fae model is I want to create a fae autumn person using the stigmas. System needs to be tweaked a little because it's designed around people that can just suck up banality forever. But I think it only needs to be tweaked. So even though like this one thing is missing, I actually think the pieces that they put in place will rebuild it in a form that is still superior to what was in previous editions. So I just, I love that whole chapter. I love almost everything about that whole chapter. <laughs> I think it's pretty fantastic. So the stigmas are sort of equivalent to the Kinane's gifts then? Kind of, they don't get, yeah, they're similar. Um, I need to go back and look at the XP dynamic with them a bit. They give the Autumn People banality when they use them. Which is weird, but the Autumn People are supposed to be kind of unstoppable horror machines, so I get it. They they don't go on tracks. It isn't like you purchase five levels. They're standalone things that they can they can pick up. And I have to admit I I've never read the the Canaan rules in detail from before, so I don't know how close they are to that. Now the gifts for the Canaan were basically you got a single birthright thing and like you some of them you could power with glamour but mostly they were just innate abilities that you had like a, a satyr canane would have a particularly hard head kind of a thing this isn't so much that this these are things they inflict on changelings or on dreamers the, it's it's a very active thing. They're written and they feel like conscious powers that they're using. They wouldn't view them as powers, but they are very active things that they do to people as opposed to just kind of, oh, I have a hard head. Oh, I can jump really high. They're much more offensive than that. The last thing, both in terms of the last thing we need to talk about and the last part of the book, is the Galane. They... Did some interesting things with the Galane in this edition. They introduced some non-European Thalane. They put the Skinwalker in as more the kind of horrible, dangerous Skinwalker that shows up as opposed to the weird, idealized version that I see occasionally, especially with white storytellers. And they put in a Polynesian Thalane, and they sort of expanded the representation outside of European cultures in this part of the world, which was really cool. They included the Hisien, much as a lot of fans aren't even certain that they're exactly changelings, but they included them and they included their whole alchemy system. It's a lot more understandable. It is a lot more usable. It's massively streamlined. And they also included the Nunahi and the Menahune, 
who are Native American Fae and Polynesian Fae. They say in the book Hawaiian for the Menehune, and that was the same in their original source book, but Hawaii culturally is part of Polynesia, so there's really applicability beyond Hawaii there. There are some weird things that I think might just be typos, so I don't want to talk about them too much. They more or less left the Galen alone, the non-European Galen. There are some European Galen as well, and they some of them became main kiths, which is kind of fun and interesting. There's expanded main kith now. There are a couple things, like they added in that there might be a Nunahi resurgence, but then they have the whole weird plot point about oh, the Nunahi struggle because Native Americans are turning away from their traditional religions and lifestyles, which I... Oh my god. Yeah, that's in there, and I'm like, I have several Native friends and I've yet to meet a Native friend that doesn't practice with their tribe. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really wish that weren't there, but then they have this resurgence hook. The long and the short with the Galane is... They were translated well. I would actually say a lot of the stuff that wasn't as playable is more playable. It's still... They're still kind of all over the place, though. I just... Ugh. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Sorry, that hurt my brain. <laughs> yeah, I just read that earlier tonight. It, I was not quite prepared for that paragraph. <laughs> like, I am totally okay with that being in there as a banality trigger. But... Yes. Yes, but uh, like one I of my mean... fa one of my favorite books, um, Ceremony by Leslie Marmon Silco, is really all about somebody who is um, Native American who's I don't remember exactly one of the Southwest tribes, and like goes off to Vietnam, is horribly traumatized by being in Vietnam, comes back and has you know, more or less completely abandoned his heritage. And the whole book is about how the way to healing for him wasn't going farther into the medical system. It was, while um, I think anti antidepressants were a part of that, the way to actually being healed was to reintegrate with his family and his culture which isn't a minority exclusive experience like everybody needs to have their family their family of choice at least and people who aren't a part of some kind of society tend to have some pretty serious issues but the whole book the whole book is about his struggle to well to get over his shame and to take the help that you know the culture that he is a part of is offering him yeah and the thing that strikes me about that story the way you described it i haven't read the book that story centers on a native experience and that's really important the nunahi in the way they're framed have never been super centered on native experience they're stories are often told in terms of Concordia. Their narrative begins when European Fae arrive and like, oh, what side did they take in the Concordance War? Oh, well, they don't have access to the higher hunting ground because of what the European Fae did. I mean, it's, it's always in relation to that. And there's even some language at the front of the Galen section that isn't talking about the Nunahi specifically, it's more generic, that talks about the Galen as the others. Yes, it uses that word. Ooh. I know. <laughs> uh, hidden away, weird, mysterious. I mean, it does, it's oh. the stereotype. It's that sentence. It is that sentence. And in the realm description, there's a little snippet at the top of the realms that says... You know, obviously this is all written from the European perspective, but if you're playing a Galane, you know, trade the realms around a Fae to a Galane would be considered a third level realm usage. And it's like, okay, okay. And I mean, it's there, but like the Nunahi don't have nobles. 
So what do they get for second level? Like none of that. They don't take the time to detail any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's that there aren't seeming triggers that make sense for their seemings. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but the thing is, (laughs) I don't want to rip on this too much because this isn't really a C20 problem. C20 (laughs) could have done more than it did to fix it, but this is a changeling problem. This isn't new. So I, yeah, I, I, I just really love to see like, and I, I know I spent like half of this, half of this conversation talking about how much I hate setting books, but like I really enjoyed War and Concordia, and I would love to see a Nunahi book along those same lines, not about the Accordance War, but about just the history of Turtle Island. Yeah. Like, this is what America was before white people showed up, and this is what America continues to be in the places that the Cathane aren't looking. Yes. So, yeah, the long and the short of it is the Galen are probably a little more playable than they used to be. Their framing is still very much around the European viewpoint. The Galen chapter is not the Galen story. The Galen chapter is the story of these other fairies and how they have kind of affected the historical events of the European Fae in America. So don't go into it hoping for a story that really centers on the Galen. It's a little less true with the Histien because the Histien are active in Asia as opposed to the Menahune and Nunahi who are active in the U.S. But the flavor for the Hisian is also very brief because they had so many rules they had to recreate. Whereas the Nonahi and the Menahune fundamentally operate sort of like normal kith. So they had a little more word count to actually devote to flavor. It's, it's an appendix. So it is what it is. It's more tightly developed than they've been in the past. So overall, I think C20 is a marked improvement on a lot of the things I and other people find really, really frustrating about Changeling, Um, especially for the systems. The systems are the most uncontroversial place that there have been improvements, but some of the some of the things that border on system, like like the banali triggers, like going into what glamour is and how you get it, and um, folding some of the glane into the kithane where it made sense, overall creates a tighter narrative focus, I think. And while I don't think anybody's going to be able to pick the book up and read it and figure out how to play the game from it, at least not people who are picking it up cold, never having played a World of Darkness game, it's definitely got a place for people who already liked Changeling. What do you think? <laughs> I, I think my, my final view of the game is a little bit rosier than yours. I think... I more or less agree with you on the rules and the rules adjacent stuff for me. And I recognize this is personal preference. There are a lot of other flavor things I really appreciate. I feel like they tied changelings into human history a little bit better. The flavor section at the beginning is confusing. You'll occasionally hit sentences where you're like, that doesn't quite fit what led up to this moment, but Aside from those moments, and I will say there are far fewer of them if you aren't super familiar with existing canon, there's much less of it. There's a lot of really good hooks there, and I think they're hooks that have been needed for a really long time. The rules are unquestionably an improvement. There's a little bit of messiness. The Galen could still stand to improve a lot. I think it's a far better foundation for the game than Changeling has ever had before in terms of a good first edition to build a line on. I actually do think someone could pick the book up cold, having never played Changeling, and figure the game out more easily than from the previous two core books. I agree with you about having never played World of Darkness. 
I would never hand this to a new WAD player and expect them to make heads or tails of it. But truth be told, I wouldn't hand any of the 20th editions to a new WAD player and ask them to make heads or tails of it. All of the 20th editions are pretty heavily written with existing players in mind. And I will say, and this I think is the biggest accomplishment of this edition, honestly, I have seen a ton of World of Darkness players online who said I never liked Changeling, but I really like C20. And, you know, this is probably just the little resentful part of me. I grew up in a town that loved the hell out of Changeling the Dreaming, and then I moved to Chicago that does not love the hell out of Changeling the Dreaming. And every time someone starts ripping on it, I just want to be like, but, but no, no, wait, huh, no, it belongs in the world of darkness. How do you not see that? So seeing all of these people that don't have investment in all this old canon for Changeling, but they have all this investment in the world of darkness, start to love the game. Man, you know, I'll kind of put aside some of my flavor nitpicks if that's happening, because that's kind of a big deal to me, because I like being able to find players. So... You know, those are kind of my thoughts on the Changeling book as it stands. And that's really everything in terms of what Simon and I have talked about in our first impressions of Changeling 20th. It's definitely a major addition to the line. It has a couple quirky edges, but it's a storyteller game. You can golden rule that stuff and nothing's too terribly structural. It's definitely worth checking out. And it should be out for purchase for anyone who isn't a backer uh, sometime in the next month or two. It's hard to say with an errata cycle on a book this large, but by the time this goes on the air, I doubt you'll have much more than a month to wait. So I would definitely, as a final thing, just say, yes, it is worth checking out. It is worth having on your bookshelf and using. Absolutely. Music from this conversation was LSD by Montplaisir.